Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Graduate Job Podcast. This week, we focus down on the sector of PR as we speak to PR expert and author Sarah Stimson. If you've ever thought about a career in PR, then this episode will blow your socks off. It's well worth listening to, no matter what you're applying for, as Sarah's insights into work experience and the application process generally are priceless. So get yourself ready, and let's crack on with episode seven. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Graduate Job Podcast. I'm very pleased today to be speaking to Sarah Stimson. Sarah is a PR and communications expert, author of the book, How to Get a Job in PR, and has over 10 years experience in communications recruitment and writing and training in the public relations industry. Sarah, a warm welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast. Thank you very much. I've given the listeners a brief introduction of you and your work. Uh, but before we jump into our topic today, would you like to introduce yourself and properly tell us a little bit more about what it is that you do? So my background is I spent a long time working as a recruiter and a headhunter in the PR industry, recruiting from graduate level all the way up to the most senior positions of director of communications. Um, and in the last five years, I have been concentrating on helping black and ethnic minority graduates into the industry where there's a severe lack of diversity. Um, I run something called the Taylor Bennett Foundation, which is a charity focused on that issue. And we run 10-week training programs as a kind of finishing school between university and then starting work. So I'm, I'm the person in charge of putting that timetable together, delivering all the employability content. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And today we're going to follow the title from your excellent book and explore how to get a job in PR. So, first things first, before we dive into the nuts and bolts, Sarah, it's a question I'm sure you've been asked a lot. What exactly is PR and what does the work entail? It's a, uh, it's a really good question because I don't think there's any defined definition of PR that does it any justice, really. In the broad strokes of things is to say that PR is about reputation management, whether that be reputation of a company or a government or an individual like a celebrity. And the way that PR people do that is by influencing the public through, usually through the media, but also through other mediums, so sometimes through something like lobbying. And, and it's really about telling a really good story. So people who can tell a good story and can write really well evolve these careers in PR. Um, and there are so many different um, sectors and disciplines within the industry. So everything from internal communication, so being the person that's responsible for communicate, communicating to a company's employees, to uh, media relations where you're talking to the press on a daily basis or um, CSR which is corporate social responsibility and that's dealing with the reputation of the company and their responsibility to the environment and to their local community. So there's, no, there's lots of different elements to PR um, but the basic skills required for all of those jobs are the same really. So it's not just all champagne and parties and ab fab stereotypes? <laughs> You know, I think that's a. I think there is an element of that, and there is, you know, there are some parts of PR that are still like that, but it's few and far between. Most PR people are seen as quite serious professionals these days, and increasingly it's becoming um, a discipline that sits on company boards. So it is taken very seriously. You mentioned then about the the skills being uh, consistent across the different types of PR. So what would be the key skills then that are needed for a successful career in PR? The, the number one skill that all employers ask for, no matter which discipline or sector you go into, are strong writing skills. So you really must be able to write really, really well with good attention to detail, with good attention to punctuation and grammar, and, and to have a, a very... Uh, it depends on who you're writing for, but most PR people are asked to have a, quite, a, quite a chatty tone, to not to be writing in an academic style. And some graduates struggle with that because they've spent three years at university writing essays and then they're expected to change to write in a more um, article-driven prose. So uh, that's the top skill that all employers ask for. And then after that, there are kind of less tangible things. So things like um, being good in a team, because there's lots of teamwork in PR, particularly at a very junior level, being able to listen to other people's ideas and being able to muck in, not being precious. So you know, being able to stuff the envelopes and sending them out to an event, as well as doing more, the more senior and strategic things. Um, an interest in the media, so reading really, really broadly, not just getting your news from the free newspapers like the Metro and the Evening Standard, where it, is, where it seems most graduates seem to be reading, but also looking at, you know, once or twice a week looking at a broadsheet, once or twice a week reading a tabloid, getting your news from a variety of sources, so not just watching 
free news on the BBC, but maybe also look at Al Jazeera and Sky and maybe some of the American channels and getting your news from a, from a broad range of places. Um, and then the, the skills that increasingly are being asked for by employers in PR are digital skills. So you would expect somebody who's leaving university now to be quite a digital native, so to be used to using social media like Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram on a daily basis. But, but you really want you to think beyond how do you use those things to how should brands use those things. So you really need to be thinking about looking at brands and how they use social media and how you might be able to use that for future clients. Now you made some interesting points there, and you mentioned the um, not just reading the free papers. Yeah. Although in my in my experience, having read them in the morning on the tube, is they're just completely filled with PR stories yeah. masquerading as um, as stories. And it's interesting reading through them and seeing which ones are made up uh, survey by you know certain companies and all those tricks. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And I and those students who study PR increasingly find themselves realising that not all the news is investigative journalism, for example, and there might be a survey by an insurance company on, you know, can women reverse their cars, for example, and that gets good news coverage. So I don't think there's anything wrong with reading the free papers, but just to make sure that you're reading a broader range of coverage to, so that you understand what's going on in the world is an important thing to do. Absolutely. And you, you, you touched upon uh, the use of social media, which is something we'll, we'll talk about later in the interview. Yep. But b before we do... Um, Thinking around, uh, you know, PR as an industry to get into, is it something that you'd recommend people need to do a degree in, or is it uh, where you can just more pick up the experience um, on the job through internships or work experience before applying? In the UK, very, very few employers ask for PR degrees as a prerequisite for entry level job. In the US, it's changed slightly, so there, there is more emphasis on you having an academic qualification in a, in a discipline. But here, still employers are more interested in your skills. So they're more interested in, do you have an interest in the media? Do you have strong writing skills? And do you have an in interest in their particular sector? So if you're going to go into tech PR, do you like technology? If you're going to healthcare PR, you might have done a science degree, for example, and want to do something slightly different. So um, at the moment, PR degrees here are not are a gateway into the industry. That said, some PR degrees have um, a work placement, and usually that can be anything between three months and 12 months long. And if you want to get a foot in the door of the industry, they're worth doing the degrees just for those work placements because mm. your experience will always trump your education when it comes to getting a job in PR. So if you can get yourself in the door somewhere and get three months' experience, you're going to be better off than someone who's just got a degree in any other subject. And it's a, it's a point that you, you know, reinforced in the book, uh, the importance of that experience. Yeah. Uh, so touching upon that, how would do you uh, recommend then people can go about getting that experience, whether through an internship or, or work experience placement? Because I know that it's such a competitive market to get them. Yeah, really competitive. I mean, the best place to start really is the PRCA website, which is the Public Relations Consultants Association. And on there, they've had a really active uh, campaign against unpaid internships. And so they list all the members um, of their organisation who pay their interns minimum wage or more. So that's definitely a good place to start, and there's, there's quite a lot of companies listed on there. They also run an apprenticeship scheme. So if you are have not gone to university and you've just finished your A-levels or, or your GCSEs and you're looking to go into the industry, there's a, there's a route into the industry for you that way. So it's definitely worth looking at those places first. Okay. And... What would, uh, I know it's a general question, but what would the um, a typical um, application process look like for getting into a, a PR company? I'm guessing they don't have the, the huge milk round type grad schemes where they're going to be taking in large numbers each year. Uh, what, would, uh, what would the different steps look like? Uh, some agencies do have those large grad schemes. So the bigger agencies in the country do, and they will do uh, maybe once or twice a year, they'll do a round of applications and they can consist of doing either a CV and cover letter application as usual, or they'll have an online application system where you fill it in online and then it goes through to their system. And then from that, they will do either interviews or they'll do an assessment day. Um, and typically you can have, I mean, I had a graduate who'd gone through our course. She did an assessment day. There were 12 grads and there was only one job. So wow. it could be really competitive. Or you can go and do a graduate um, an assessment day where there were 20 people there and they've got four jobs on offer. So, you know, it depends on the company. So the bigger companies do do those kind of grad schemes. Even smaller ones now tend to offer um, either placements if you're doing a, a PR degree or a grad scheme at entry level. But the, you know, the best way into the industry, I think, is to write speculative applications because when you're sending your application into a grad scheme, 
and you're competing against a good 100 other applications. Whereas if you're sending your CV in speculatively to the right person, your might, yours might be the only CV they see that day. So you have a much better chance of actually being noticed. That would always be my preference in terms of finding yourself a job. And that means doing your research, finding out what that company does, who is the person in particular that you should be writing to, not just writing to the info at or admin at address on the website, and tailoring your letter specifically for that company. I agree. And following on from there, what would... What would a, a good CV focused, uh, a PR focused CV look like? So on your PR CV, really the things you want to highlight most are any PR experience that you have or any relevant experience. So relevant experience for PR would include uh, any event stuff you might have done. So have you worked at events? Have you been a waiter, a waiter for example, that kind of thing? Or um, any journalism experience you have. So have you written anything? You've had anything published? And it doesn't have to have been paid pub, paid. Um, published work either so it might be that you just write a really brilliant blog you really want to highlight those things in your CV because those are the skills that the employer is looking for um, and then apart from that obviously your academic achievements making sure that you list your degree grade and your A-level grades because if you don't list them the employer will assume that you've got really poor ones so you need to make sure that you list them yep. um, and um, highlighting anything in your hobby section that would be relevant for the job so you know, the fact that you read a range of different newspapers, who your favourite columnist is, for example, or any work experience that you may have done on the local newspaper, any poetry that you have published, anything like that that's relevant to the job is really important. How would you structure a, a covering letter to make sure that it stands out and is actually going to get read? Um, I would always say don't write anything more than a page. The page is absolutely plenty. We um, looked at some employers and we timed some recruiters, actually, that were reading CVs and how long they looked at each CV. And on average, they were looking at CVs for 30 to 45 seconds and then not looking at cover letters for much longer than that. So you really need to put all the important information first. So what job you're applying for and the reference number if there is one, if you're applying for a specific position or that you're writing on a speculative basis, and then you need to write why they should hire you. So... Far too often, graduates concentrate in their cover letters on why they, what, what would be good for them for working at the company. So if you hire me, I'll get experience in this, and it'll be a chance for me to grow my experience, and it'll be a chance for me to build on what I've done before. The companies are not interested in what they can do for you. They're interested in what you can do for them. So you need to be saying to them, if you hired me, I would be the eyes of ears of the social media because I'm on it every day, and I would be a good asset to the team because I understand what's going on in the world because I have good pop affairs knowledge so highlighting what you bring to their company you mentioned 30 to 40 seconds uh, per CV I'm surprised it's that high actually I thought they would have uh, you know just a quick cursory look five seconds and then either yes or no and next moving on to the next one yeah no I mean it, it is really ruthless and when you get graduates often complain to me that they don't hear back from employers when they when they are applying for jobs that's because employers are getting, you know, hundreds of applications for every graduate job, and it's just not practical to, to do that kind of admin. And so you, to make yourself stand out from the crowd, you've got to get all the, imp all the important information in front of the employer as quickly as possible. Having worked in um, PR recruitment, you must have come across hundreds of candidates um, at different stages. Yep. What are the common mistakes that people tend to make to let themselves down as they go through the recruitment process? Um, poorly written CVs and cover letters is the number one thing. So if you've got um, grammatical errors, punctuation errors, typos in your CVs, you are going to go straight in the bins. Because if you can't do those things right, there's no way you're going to be able to write a press release correctly. I once had a CV where, in his hobbies, the candidate had listed murder as his hobby. <laughs> and uh, it turned out on, on the further investigation that he'd meant murder mystery parties. <laughs> but less than a couple of words off, so it's important that you proofread. <laughs> Definitely. Oh dear, that's a bit of a howl. <laughs> and uh, no, I completely agree. So when I've been sifting through uh, applications for graduate schemes, and you know, if I come across the slightest grammatical error or spelling mistake, it would for me it would be a no. Because if you can't be bothered to make sure that the application form for a job is correct. No, it doesn't say a lot about your general attention to detail exactly. and what you'd be like if you didn't get the job. Exactly. And the other common mistake is getting the name of the person on that you're writing to. And this happens when, when graduates cut and paste. So they'll just cut and paste the letter they sent to another company and then they get the name of the company wrong or the name of the person they're writing to wrong. And that's an immediate in the bin. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite an embarrassing yeah. one, that one. 
Or if they get the names uh, the wrong way around, yeah. depending on the, the name and first name, surname, that's another another no no. So you mentioned earlier about this about social media and how on top of social media do you expect good candidates to be in terms of having a, a blog presence or having an you know active active Twitter account, mm. etc. I would fully expect all graduates now that are applying for PR jobs to be really active on Twitter. If nothing else, it's an amazing network tip tool because so many journalists and PR on, PRs are on Twitter, so you should definitely be on there. Um, in terms of blogs, for the Taylor Bennett Foundation, when we take our grads, if they haven't already got a blog, we make them set one up because basically a blog becomes your online platform. It becomes your online portfolio for your writing. So if you can show employers that you can write well through doing something online, you're a step ahead of most other grads. Also, it can show your interest in the industry, so you can write something about either a specific industry, so you might want to write about fashion or food or something, or you might want to write about a particular part of PR, so you might want to write about internal communications or CSR, or combine those things and talk about consumer PR for fashion brands, for example, to make it really, really neat. So I would always encourage grads to set up blogs. They're free to do. You only have to publish once or twice a week, and you can get pretty quick following by sharing on social media. And with the blogs, would you recommend that they kept it um, uh, completely professional? Uh, so focus you know, just on the aspect of PR that they were they were going to, or you know, is it okay to have pictures of fluffy cats and uh, you know cakes that they've made, etc.? I think I think you can do the personal thing too, but there's a, there's a fine line. So if you look at my blog, it's mostly professional. So occasionally I'll put something personal up, but everything else on there is kind of my blog is um, aimed at helping. PR people into the industry and you know, helping them move jobs. So there's lots of kind of career advice pieces on there, and I try to keep it like that. I tend to keep my my personal stuff on my Facebook account where I don't have very many um, work acquaintances at all. So if they're on there and they're, they're from work, they're they must be on it because most of the things on my Facebook account are kind of pictures of my baby and the dog, um, and they're not work related. So I think you have yep. to choose your platform. Twitter is an interesting one because there you yes you need to be professional but also you need some kind of personality otherwise you become very boring to follow you don't want to just be broadcasting all the time so there needs to be a level of engagement and it's a really easy way for graduates to contact very senior people and have engagement with them that they may not be able to reach any other way so imagine i'm a current student thinking about going into pr how would you recommend that i begin that engagement with uh, senior thought leaders in the industry or people who might be able to help me uh, with my career? So one of the things you could, they can do is offer to write guest posts for blogs. So find people who write senior blogs, or senior people who are writing blogs online around the industry, and then say to them, you know, can I pitch an idea to you for me to write a piece for your blog? And then you're getting all the traffic from their website coming to your website. So it's a brilliant way of getting your, your blog in front of lots of people in the industry. Um, and also, you might want to think about um, engaging with them when they're talking about a particular topic. So say, oh, I had that experience and this is what happened to me. And just getting your name known within those circles. You talk in your book about uh, creative applications. Yes. How um, important is it to be creative in how you apply for positions? And are there any uh, top tips that you'd recommend in terms of how to go about it or things that have worked in the past? So creative applications are anything other than sending a CV and cover letter, which is the standard way to apply for a PR job. And my advice always would be to judge your audience carefully, because if you are sending an application to a public sector department, for example, it's unlikely that a creative application is going to have much impact. In fact, it'll probably be seen as inappropriate. So you just want to be careful about who you send them to. That said, if you're applying to a kind of funky digital agency or a consumer brand agency, quite often they'll want you to do something that makes you stand out. So a couple of the PR agencies that do grad schemes, for example, specifically ask that you don't send CV and cover letters and you send something. Oh, do they? Yeah, yeah. So they could ask for... So And for those kinds of applications, I've seen things like um, one candidate sent her CV in on cupcakes. I had, oh. There was one candidate who sent a singogram. Um, somebody else who put their CV up on a billboard. There was somebody who wrote, um, uh, did a London tube map, and each line on the tube map was like one was education, one was experience, one was hobbies, and then each stop had a different thing on it. So you, you can have 
you know, there are really good ways of impressing employees with creative applications if you think about it carefully, but you have to think about what's appropriate for that employer. Increasingly, I was speaking to an MD of an agency last week who's about to start recruiting for, in, for PR interns, and he asked for no CVs, but they asked for a one-minute YouTube video, and that's increasing in common um, because they want to see, you know, are you articulate, can you speak well, can you get your point across in a minute, can you be persuasive? So that's why... Um, people are increasingly moving away from CVs into how can we get to see people quickly and then for them to make an impact in front of us. Interesting. I can see why it would be uh, the application on cupcakes probably went down quite well yeah. with the, with the <laughs> yeah. team. Yeah, well, straight, straight to their stomach. It's the way forward, I think. <laughs> yeah. But as, you, as you mentioned, the, the key is just to make sure that you're tailing it to the specific audience. Yeah, exactly. And also, these things, you know, you've got to take time. You've got to think about them clearly and, and put a lot of effort in to make sure that they, they land and are successful. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit, thinking ahead to you've applied for the job, you've been successful and you've got the job, how can you make sure that you land with impact in the first six months? That's a good question. So my advice always in the first six months is to learn as much as possible. That's your opportunity to ask questions because when in the first three to six months of a job, an employer expects you to ask about everything and for you to be inquisitive and curious. Once you get to six months in, if you're still asking those questions, they're going to be wondering why you weren't asking them four months ago. So you need to ask as many questions as you can as quickly as possible. And also to make take advantage of the people around you to learn. So if there are people there who've got a long history of working in social media, although not that many people have got a long history in it these days, but a history of working in social media or have worked on a particular newspaper or they've just got some interesting experience that you want to learn about, there is nothing wrong with asking if you can go for a coffee and pick their brains about something. There is nothing worse than a grad who sits in a corner and says nothing. So yep. you really need to make sure that you are giving your input into um, into the company and not just being the person that does the photocopying. So to make, your, make the company aware that you're adding some value. No, I completely agree. And you mentioned in the book how, uh, as well that you need to, you know, not be too precious at the beginning and uh, expect to be going straight into making important pitches or be happy to, as you mentioned, make the tea and do the filing or whatever just to uh, make yourself useful. Yeah, I think sometimes it's a bit of a shock to assistant to graduates because they've spent three years at university. Some of those would have been on PR degrees. So they would have got a lot of theory of PR. And then they go and get their first PR job and they are upset that they're not expected to help run the crisis for BP or something. And, yes. uh, and I think you, you just have to consider that the people that are ahead of you in that business have been there for a long time and they've had to pay their dues and they'll expect you to do the same. So that does mean that you'll be doing the more junior job. So doing the media clippings, doing the photocopying, you know, making your share of tea and coffee. I wouldn't expect you to make all of it. But, you know, to, you know, to, make a, to offer to make coffee when other people are on your team with you, um, you know, doing the event mail out, doing all the really junior things because it's only through doing those things really well that you'll be given more responsibility. Completely agree and everybody loves it as well if you can make a good cup of tea. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Yorkshire Tea Gold is the way forward, uh, top tip there <laughs> for the listeners. I think slightly biased on the Yorkshire front. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. <laughs> so you mentioned at the beginning of the episode about your day job being with the Taylor Bennett Foundation. Yeah. Could you tell the listeners a little bit more about what their work is and how they might be able to apply in future? Yeah. So the foundation was set up in 2008 by the communications headhunter Taylor Bennett. Um, and Taylor Bennett focused on placing very senior people into the communications industry in in-house roles. So the head of communications for Sky or Coca-Cola or Santander or something like that. So those kinds of positions. And increasingly they were asked that their shortlist of candidates reflected a more diverse population. So looking at kind of black and ethnic practitioners. And sadly there were very few black and ethnic practitioners in PR in the senior in senior positions. And so when Heather McGregor, who is the MD of Taylor Bennett and the founder of the foundation, started to think about how could she address this problem from a business angle, actually it made sense to do something philanthropic and to attack it at the more graduate level so that in 10 years' time this isn't such an issue. Actually, when we first started thinking about the foundation, um, no one was talking really about diversity in PR. Very few people were, thought it was an issue. And now it's a really, really hot topic and all the industry bodies are on board and most of the large PR agencies are on board. So we have support from um, a wide wide range of companies within the sector. And what we do is we take six graduates for 10 weeks 
each course is sponsored by a different PR agency. So in the last year, those agencies have been the Red Consultancy, Brunswick, Finsbury, and MHP Communications. Um, and each course has a slightly different focus. So for MHP, for example, it's a slightly more generalist focus because they have departments who handle both healthcare, tech, tech PR, financial PR, consumer PR brand across the whole gamut. Whereas something like Finsbury and Brunswick, they do kind of financial and corporate PR. So each course has a slightly different focus. And in those 10 weeks, they spend some time at the agencies learning from the people there. They are given weekly tasks to do, so we set them lots and lots of writing tasks. Because as you know, writing is such an important part of PR, so we, we do lots of that. And then they go off on lots of different visits to lots of different PR and uh, in-house and PR agencies. So in the last year, that's included 10 Downing Street, Buckingham Palace, Channel 4, Morgan Stanley, ITN, you know, lots of different places, but really interesting places for them to learn from. Um, so it's a brilliant, brilliant course. At the end of the 10 weeks, we, we will help them go off and get jobs. So we give them employability training. They get CV writing and uh, cover letter writing, interview skills. We do some work around professionalism, so making sure you know how to answer an email correctly and how to make a telephone call, which you might think are very basic skills, but actually universities are not that great at teaching those things. So um, we kind of finish them off to be more work-ready. And then at the end of the 10 weeks, we would hope they would go and get jobs. So um, about 70% of our students then go off and get jobs in PR. And actually, in the last year, it's been more like 90%. So we have a really good hit rate wow. yeah, and stickability. And in terms of applications, the next course is going to run in April next year. That will be sponsored by MHP. And we are going to have the application form on our website very shortly in the next couple of weeks. Um, so if you just put Taylor Bennett Foundation into Google, we'll come up. Um, and the application process is a very long application form where we're testing um, your writing skills and your commitment to the course. And then we um, hold an assessment day. So we have 20 candidates come to the assessment day and six of those will be offered places. And they're offered them on the Friday and they start the following Monday. So it really is a quick turnaround. Wow, that sounds it sounds an amazing opportunity. Yeah, it's um, amazing. Everyone who's been through it has said, and in fact quite a lot of people have been through it and said, I learnt more. Um, in 10 weeks with you than I did three years at university, which either says we were really brilliant or our universities weren't great, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm guessing the advice to listeners is get the application in early and make sure it's a good application. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, unlike most companies where I would say to you, you know, don't wait until the deadline because people will shut, they'll, they'll shut applications early if they get too many applications. We don't do that. So, you know, you can wait to the deadline. I would say 90% of applications we receive come on deadline day. But if you're a minute past the deadline, it goes in the bin because we don't put up with anyone who's late. So, you know, if you're going to get your application in and you think you might have problems with your computer, we don't have, we don't take any excuses. So if you can't get your application in on time, you're not considered for the course. So that's my uh, point. <laughs> that's, that's wise advice. And, yeah, as you said, if 90% are coming in in the final week, say, then, you know, it pays to make sure that yours in early so that people can spend more time looking at yours as opposed to exactly. a quick quick flick later on yeah I, I tend to sit with them all around me on my living room floor <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of applications and i sit and read through them on the floor and then put them into yes no piles yes no piles and a maybes so yeah and i'm quite ruthless so i i am quite my colleagues will say i'm quite harsh because i i do you know any wrong comma or apostrophe and they're out i'm afraid it's uh with that many applications you can afford to be picky exactly Moving on now to the lightning round, where we ask some quick questions before the end of the show. So, firstly, what book would you recommend for listeners to read? There's a book called Share This, which is written by um, a variety, variety of different PR practitioners and published by the CIPR. And I recommend you read that because it is an insight into what PR practitioners are looking for in terms of social media skills. So if you are interested in digital media at all, that's definitely worth a read. Excellent. That's uh, one I've not heard of myself, so I'll add that to my list. Right, okay. And what website uh, would you also recommend? There is a website written by PR students and academics called Behind the Spin. Um, so if you're a student or a graduate and you're just looking about to embark on your career in PR, it's a really good place to start. It's, it's um, hosted by a guy called Richard Bailey. He works at one of the universities up north in Leeds, I think, actually. And um, he, he has a variety of different students who write different pieces for it. And also they'll take submissions. So if you want to write about something in PR and you want to be published somewhere, 
won't be paid for it, but your submission may get published on their blog. So it's definitely worth having having a look at that. Super. And the links to all the websites and books that we've mentioned will be in the show notes Great. on the website. And finally, moving on to today, what one tip could you share with listeners that they could implement today? If there's one thing I would recommend for you to do, it would be to get on Twitter and to be active on it. So to get on there, make sure you've got a, a, a username that's suitable for work, so not kind of hot stuff at, but maybe <laughs> something a bit... I've already got that one. <laughs> something a bit more professional. Um, and to follow lots of people on Twitter. So if you find me, you'll find that I've got lists of journalists and lists of PR people. You can just follow those whole lists if you want to. Um, or you know, find some senior PR people and find who they're following and find out who, who's interested in, in the industry that way. It's the number one way of you finding the right kind of people to be applying to. So networking is really, really important. And, and obviously that's not easy, particularly if you're not based in London, to do it physically. But you can do it um, virtually online very easily by getting yourself on Twitter. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Before we close, you know, how can people connect with you on Twitter and LinkedIn and your blog, etc.? So if you, um, my blog is stimsonsarah.com, so that's easy to find. Um, my uh, Twitter handle is guru, which is G-O-O-R-O-O, um, which is a play on the word guru, which is a kind of a dirty word in PR, really. I don't like to say that I'm a guru. <laughs> so... Um, you can find me there, and then if you just stick my name into LinkedIn, I come up. In fact, if you put my name into Google, I think I'm the first 10 or 20 um, results on Google, so I'm fairly easy to find. Excellent. Thank you again for your time today, no and uh, speak to you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Many thanks again to Sarah for her insights into how to get a job in PR. She made so many good points, it's going to be difficult just to settle on three things to take away. But the most powerful thing for me was when she said, your experience will always trump your education when it comes to getting a job in PR. Your experience will always trump your education. Now I know that's something that you probably don't want to hear after spending three years and many thousands of pounds at university, but it's vital that you do get that experience. Be proactive, get out there, volunteer, write for the local paper, start a blog, get an internship. Sarah's blog last week on her website had a post detailing 150 PR internships, work experience placements or entry level roles. So those jobs and roles are out there. It's just a question of getting on the front foot and going to get them. And speaking of experience, if you're eligible for it, make sure you apply to the Taylor Bennett Foundation. It's an amazing scheme and applications are now open for spring 2015. Just make sure you don't leave the application down to the last day with the, with the other 90% of applicants. The second key point for me was on being proactive and making speculative applications. In industries such as PR, these can work really, really well, especially if you combine it with careful research and interaction with the recipient via social media. Check out episode 5 with Mildred Talabi for more tips on how to use social media to interact and build relationships Finally, I love the point about being explicit in the covering letter about what you can do for the company and not just what they can do for you. In my experience, this is very rarely done, so do it and stand out above the crowd. That's episode 7, done and dusted. You can find a full transcript of everything that we've discussed and all the links at graduatejobpodcast.com slash PR. Please get in touch with us on Twitter at gradjobpodcast. And also, if you've enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes, just as LJK100 did this week and left us five stars saying, my New Year's resolution is to sort my career out and get a job I'm actually interested in. A friend recommended that I listen to the podcast for some help and inspiration and it's been really, really useful already. Definitely worth a listen. Thank you very much, LJK. And do join us next week when we speak to Jack Catherall and cover the topic of video CVs. I hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you next week.